Well, thank you. I know that this is the talk you've all been awaiting for. And uh, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that I really appreciate the specificity of this venue. And I hope that it'll remind all of you to write semantic HTML or HTML for my British friends. So this talk is a little bit different than what you've heard today. Um, I'm so excited to be here. It's been a wonderful day hearing all of these amazing talks, and I'm really excited to go home and make some cool shit. Um, but before giving this talk, I feel like it's important for you all to get to know me a little bit. And what better way to get to know me than to uh, see me through the lens of all of the careers that I've tried to entertain. So first, uh, in my teens and uh, early 20s, I really wanted to be a journalist, a foreign correspondent. And I just thought that there was no more amazing career path than one where I could generate a story about anything from sewer covers to Watergate and a, a medium where you had so much power that through journalism and through storytelling, you could take a white supremacist and humanize him as Rolling Stone did, or you could victimize a 12-year-old black boy who was shot by the police. So it really impacted me in a huge way, and, and that's where I come from, is from that journalism background. And when I graduated in 2008, it turns out that's when something called the death of print was coming. And you might all recall that. Uh, it was this concept that everything uh, might, the, the entire newspaper industry might completely uh, foil upon itself. And um, there was a little website at the time called twitter.com, and we wrote twits. I don't know if you remember that, but it, it, they weren't always called tweets. And people were really worried about how this microblogging platform could change the future of journalism. So when I graduated into that recession, I recognized that it wasn't going to be possible for me to be a journalist. That wasn't an advantageous career. I had also studied math and environmental science, which were also not very smart choices, um, vocationally speaking. But I had a, a small advantage here um, in that when I was 10 years old, I learned how to design. And somewhat ironically, um, my parents owned what's called a pre-press business. And what pre-press is, was, it, or was, was this uh, business where they would take big film and cut it into pieces, put it in position uh, mechanically, and then take uh, big, large format ca cameras, would take photos of that film, and then print it onto press plates. They owned that entire pre-press process. That entire process became digitized nearly overnight, and uh, they, uh, were left you know, entrepreneurs with uh, this kind of big void where they realized they needed to do something. So my dad went to school full time, and my mom uh, basically worked three jobs in order to support what it was now a single income family. As a 10-year-old, um, I was basically brought along with my dad. It turns out you're not allowed to leave kids for that long on their own. Uh, so I went to school with my dad. They set me up on a gumdrop Mac in the back of his class and I learned uh, destructive Photoshop, that is Photoshop before layers, which is terrifying, um, and things like Corel Draw and Publisher. Um, and I really love telling newer developers that these are the newest frameworks that they haven't learned yet, and they always get really freaked out. I'm like, oh yeah, React, oh no, no one's hiring for that anymore. It's really about Corel Draw now. And they're just like, oh God. <laughs> Um, but I, I learned that and um, I explored all these career paths that I told you about. When I graduated and had no career prospects, I did um, what any entrepreneur would do and I emailed every single person I knew. I opened my address book, like my physical address book, and transcribed all these email addresses and emailed everyone a custom note that said, hi, I have some design skills, what can I make for you? And it's really incredible what I got back. Um, belly dancers, uh, postmodern jazz, press kits, uh, websites for single origin and coffee. And luckily, I had gained some skills in web development uh, when I made uh, my fan site in sync2000.net. I learned HTML. It used frame sets to create an American flag. I'm not sure that I'm that much of a patriot anymore, but it was a pretty dope site and sadly not archived on the web archive, so I can't show you. But I will be rebuilding it in CSS Grid one day. So. Um, 
I, I worked as a designer after that and went in through various uh, jobs where I used my design skills, the last of which was at a, an agency, which I worked at, had two designers, and I built the team to 26 designers, developers, content strategists, and, uh, and writers. And I found myself, after five years working there, 50, 60 hour weeks, being extremely burnt out. So I did what any logical person would do, and I did a hard reset on my life. So I uh, quit my job, my relationship, uh, ended, terminated my lease early, uh, bought a one-way ticket to Europe, and traveled for three months to figure out what it was that I was doing. Why, why am I here? And what is it about design that I really love? And it was then looking at art in Europe and refinding myself that I realized that um, everything that we do, the reason why I was burnt out is that I was helping corporations to sell shit. Like I was making Jeff Bezos richer. I don't need to do that. He's got plenty of money. And so this recontextualized my life through these careers and journalism taught me to seek stories, not just the ones that we know to seek, but the ones that we often overlook and from voices that we often overlook. And design taught me that our solutions are only as good as the way we frame the problem. And advocacy and activism taught me that justice for some, which is default, does not mean justice for all, and that we must dedicate ourselves to seeking justice for all. And so now what my life work is and what I seek to do is to seek solutions for justice. My name is Tatiana Mack, and I'm here to speak to you about how privilege defines performance. So when I launched this talk at um, a performance conference, I was going after Adi Osmani, and he's like the, the darling of web performance. I recognized that um, being a quote unquote non-technical talk, I would engage people. So I decided to make this into a plugin. And with any plugin, it's in beta because we're still testing this out. But before you saw anything, there's some terms and conditions, which is, this is a different kind of talk, I recognize that. And I may be saying some things today that might make you feel uncomfortable. For some of you, um, these are your lived experiences and, and you might be nodding in, in solidarity. So I hold the space for you. But for those of you, many of you, who this might make uncomfortable, I just ask you to do one thing, which is to sit with that discomfort. First of all, it's temporary. And it's discomfort that many of us feel chronically and that we don't get to get rid of. And that you don't have to do anything with it. Um, you can just sit with it. And maybe even offer uh, a little space for why I, with my lived experience, might be telling you this story today. Um, and like with any terms and conditions, you have to accept them. <laughs> so here you go. So when we think about privilege, I think there's a couple of faces that come to mind. Um, Regina George from Mean Girls, Jordan Belafort, uh, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, the real life uh, Wolf of Wall Street tycoon, or even Moira Rose from Schitt's Creek, hilarious show. But these, these uh, characters of privilege aren't preserved just for fiction, um, they're also preserved for reality and nonfiction with our girl Kimmy Kim K, um, this dumpster fire. <laughs> Um, and then this darling of tech who um, we all know very well, and he knows us very well, it turns out. I think it's always helpful to start with the definition. So when thinking about privilege, the definition is that it's a special right, advantage, or immunity granted to only a particular person or group. And this is an important distinction because I think we often, as we do with many things in tech, think about privilege as a binary. You're either privileged or you're not. But really a privilege here is a standalone idea that it's a singular right granted to you based on certain characteristics. Thinking about characteristics and the way in which we research users, for example, um, or categorize users, uh, these are eight of the most common. And I will give you the caveat right now that this is not an exhaustive list. There are many other ways in which we commonly categorize people, but I'm a designer. This is an 18, 16 by nine ratio and eight fits. <laughs> to read them out, um, race, class, gender, religion, physical ability, orientation, nationality, and mental ability. Let's slot these with some common characteristics. White, wealthy, 
cis male, Protestant, able-bodied, hetero, American, and neurotypical. I might have described a lot of you in the audience here today and in tech in general. And when I first gave this talk, I continued to talk about the implicit association test, which is essentially this test where you're given um, a face and you either have to pick whether it's uh, good or bad. And white people, is on, white people are good is on one side and black people are bad is on the other. And the intent is to show the implicit bias we have against black folks. Um, but, and this is the book that I alluded to that talks about it. But as with work in this space, um, I recognize after a friend pointed out to me that that's not the right place to focus. Um, and she wrote an article, she's brilliant. Uh, her name is uh, Chenda Prescott Weinstein. She's a particle physicist and she wrote this article about how this concept of diversity is really dangerous. If we're talking about Im the implicit association test, those are things that we literally can't help. They're just implicitly ingrained in us. When out there, a lot of the stuff that's happening is explicit. People are being explicitly racist, homophobic, transphobic, ableist. So we need to, we need to refocus our efforts on true anti-racism work. I highly recommend this article. It's very long and it's uh, very verbose. Uh, but it does an excellent job about pointing out what's wrong with diversity today. So what if I told you when I said that that white, hetero, male, cisgendered, neurotypical, wealthy, American male um, was not random that it's common? What if I told you that, in fact, this is systematized? And what if I told you that system was the white, supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. For those of you who are familiar, that is a phrase coined by the brilliant black feminist, Bell Hooks. And she coined this phrase because people often tried to extract whether the oppression she experienced was because she was black or because she was a woman. And she said, well, it's, it's all intertwined. Um, you know, we can't fight the patriarchy without f recognizing that it's under the super set of capitalism, which is under the super set of white supremacy. And uh, that intersectionality of those systems is something, and that term of intersectionality is coined by another brilliant black feminist, Kimberly Crenshaw. I wish more people would re read both of them. So when we look at this grid um, of white, wealthy, Protestant, cis, able-bodied, hetero-American, neurotypical cis males, we have to remember that this is who founded, aka colonized America. They wanted to put themselves in power and make things easiest for them. If you look at all of the founders of founders of this country, colonizers, uh, this, these are the criteria that they met. So they put every policy and system into place to maximize their success. And this system is pervasive. It's not just in the most obvious ways, but it's in our criminal justice system. It's in our medical care. It's in the way that we draw, um, how we jan gerrymander districts. It's in every single system, including tech. And you might be sitting here today, as I can see by the stares I'm getting, which is, well, but I'm not privileged. I have a secret to tell all of you. We all are. By being here in this room, by having the privilege of attending this amazing conference, being in one another's company, working in one of the highest paid growing industries in America, we are all intrinsically privileged to be here. And so, I told you it was a plugin, so we'll install the privilege plugin. Oh, but there's some dependencies. 39,431, so we're gonna be here a second while we wait for this NPM install. But the first dependency is to confront our privilege. So I'll start with me, because you all might be feeling a little uncomfortable. And the boxes I check are, um, I'm wealthy, I'm able-bodied, I'm American and I'm neurotypical. That comprises this little block here. But none of us really likes to be defined in such binary terms. And as much as we love to write binary code and have you know, that, that Boolean, we don't like it when it's used to define us. We, we like to believe that we're fuller beings than that. So let's add some commentary. I might be able-bodied, but I'm pretty short. And as you can see from this lectern, like compared to Phil, who clearly was like, 
normal looking. I am like a child up here. And I have a lot of parents looking back like, why is that kid up there um, on that lectern? Um, and I'm reminded of this also uh, when I try to leave my apartment. Um, I'm not tall enough to clear the sensor, so I just like run into the door all the time. And while I'm American and I'm a natural born citizen, I'm a first generation Asian American, which means that every time I get into a lift and I'm alone, I get the question, where are you from? Portland? No, where are you really from? Portland? No, you know what I mean. And that conversation happens every time because the way that I look doesn't embody what people think of as Americans. And while I'm wealthy and I have a MacBook Pro up here, um, I am moderately wealthy and raised poor. I'm not Jeff Bezos rich. Um, and uh, my parents uh, made all of their wealth, so they didn't have generational wealth when they immigrated here. And while neurotypical, I experienced suicidal ideation and depression. And it's not just the, the check boxes that we squarely fit into, it's also our proximity to the other things. So while I'm not white and cis male and hetero and Protestant, um, I'm relatively light skinned. So I have a tremendous amount of privilege there. Being Asian American and the whole quote unquote minority myth um, where you know Asians are rich, so you don't experience racism. Like, those types of things, um, my proximity to whiteness uh, helps me tremendously. And while I'm not a cis male, I don't believe in the gender binary, which is why I use both she and they pronouns. Um, I, I have a lot of privilege in presenting in a way that society perceives that's congruous with the way that I see myself. And while I'm not Protestant, um, I don't have a religious head covering, say, that immediately reveals what religion I practice. There's a little plot twist for you. Privilege alone is harmless. So here, um, and side note, uh, if you ever come to any of my talks, they are very full of uh, Mean Girls. I guess it's a dependency is that you have to watch this movie. And you can do that while you're waiting for NPM to install next time. Um, but uh, my friends are always just like, can you stop trying to make prefetch a thing? <laughs> see. Sorry, Nick. I just needed to save all the puns for me. So that's why I was so mad. Um, so she's pretty harmless in this movie. If you haven't seen it, I'll step back. Um, so she's pretty harmless in this movie. Um, for those of you who don't know, Mean Girls is a, from 2004. is written by Tina Fey. And uh, Lindsay Lohan's character, Katie, uh, comes to this new school. Uh, she lived in Africa, which they all think is so weird because she's white. And um, she makes friends, tries to make friends with the in crowd, aka the Mean Girls. And this is Gretchen. And she's kind of the ditzy one, relatively harmless, right? But, and that's a big but, she has a friend, Regina George, who's very powerful. And that's because privilege gains us power. So while I have this block here, what I didn't tell you about this is that everyone has one. So that's an average white guy in tech. <laughs> and when I showed you this, grid here, I didn't tell you that this is a wall. And our privilege block is what puts our position against that wall. And when we look at this, I think it's really hard to swallow because we want to say like, well, I'm, I'm not privileged. Like, I think we're still trying to reconcile that idea. But I think we need to remember that privilege doesn't dictate how hard we work or how far we go but it determines where we start. So while I started lower than that average guy, I can still work twice as hard to get just as far as him, but I have to work twice as hard. And for those of you who have friends in marginalized and especially multiple marginalized groups, you might hear them say things like, I have to work twice as hard to get half as far. That's what it is. They have to climb that wall in order to just get to ground, to, to, the, to the baseline that someone that checks all those boxes gets. And that's because our privileges are invisible to us. There's this great cartoon that came from The New Yorker, but I don't particularly care for The New Yorker style, and it's not very accessible. So I redrew it with Pac-Man, because I think it's cuter. And the dot says, the world is unjust. And then Pac-Man says, I don't know, there's some justice. And then Pinky's like, the world is just. 
we analyze this a bit, um, we can see that the dot can't move. It has a fixed position um, and is there, whereas Pac-Man and Pinky can. They can, you know, Pac-Man can run from Pinky and Pinky's just singular goal is to chase Pac-Man. And the privileges that we got, the privilege blocks that we were born with are completely random. However, the system that grants us the power is not. And so when we look at this again, most days we're not looking towards our privilege because we don't have someone yelling at us about privilege on a stage. Most days we're looking towards our oppression. We're looking not towards what we take for granted and the, the ways in which that system that I told you about benefits us, but instead we look towards what we don't have and the ways that the system disadvantages all of us. And there's a reason for that, which is capitalism scares us with scarcity. It tells us that there's not enough in the world for, to go around for all of us. So we better work harder. We better pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and, and get that first seat in, in line. That didn't make it, first seat in line, what? Get that first spot in line? That made no sense. A few months ago, Lyft IPO'd at $24.3 billion. Um, this is Logan Green, um, and he's only worth uh, $760 million now, which um, I would swipe left on Tinder on that alone. Like, that's all you got, dude? Um, and let's look at the average Lyft driver, uh, which, by the way, this is when I Googled average Lyft driver, this homie came up, and I'm like, I don't know what Lyfts you all have been in, but that's not what my Lyft drivers look like. <laughs> Um, and MIT did a study that found that the average Lyft driver is raking in $3.30 an hour. That's less than federal minimum wage. If you do the math of 40 hours a week times 52 weeks a year with no vacation, no health care benefits, any vacation, that's $7,000. That's not enough to live on. That's what I think you need a month in the Bay Area. And so I think when we look at this, we recognize that we, we can't earn everything that we receive. We don't earn everything that we receive. Because if we did, that means that Logan G works 128,000 times harder than the average Lyft driver. Or for most of us, somewhere between 80 to 100,000 times harder than us. And I think we'd all agree that that's not the case. He doesn't work that much harder than us. And we might be feeling a number of ways about this. This might make us angry or make, make us feel really sad or like just uncomfortable. And the idea behind this is something called meritocracy, which is that things such as goods or power should be vested based on talent, effort, and achievement rather than factors like sexuality, race, gender, age, or wealth. Meritocracy is one of the best tools for capitalism because again, it tells you it doesn't matter who you are, you can get anything you want if you just work hard enough. The saddest story about meritocracy is that it was written by Michael Young about the London education system, and it was intended to be a satire. Well, I don't know if any of you follow The Onion on Twitter, but if you do and you read the comments that they get back, it's very clear that we still to this day do not really understand satire and that when you write something, people are going to take you seriously. And on his deathbed, I'm pretty sure his last words were like, fuck, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Excuse my language. Sorry, Zach. I'm sorry, okay. And that's the thing is that meritocracy was always a, a satirical concept, but of course the jabronis that have the biggest microphones like don't realize that and are using it as a real thing. So I invite you here to a funeral. We're gonna say goodbye to meritocracy. Whenever we say goodbye to anything in our lives, or so my therapist tells me, we experience grief, five stages of them, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, where we all hope to get to. So this is what it might look like. Denial is like, I worked hard for everything, so no. Anger, slavery wasn't my fault. To bargaining, why not a men's month? <laughs> to depression, I hate my privilege. To acceptance, where I really hope we can get to, which is that privilege is not my fault, but it is my responsibility. The great James Baldwin reminds us that nothing can be changed until it is faced, which is why we're here today facing it. When I told you that Gretchen, little Gretchen here, 
privileged with her friend Regina. It's not all the picture. We also have two other cool cats here. Uh, Lindsay, who represents bias, and Amanda Seyfried, who represents ignorance. And while privilege gains us our power, ignorance is what hides our bias. So next dependency is to admit your bias. Look at how far along that's coming. It's a great install. Make a sandwich. All right. So here we're back to this grid that, and wall that I've shown you. When we look at this wall through the lens of tech, this is a graph from the WCAG Majestic Millions. For those of you who don't work in accessibility, the Majestic Million was uh, the WCAG's assessment of the accessibility of the one million most popular sites earlier this year. And the results were really tragic. And it was one of those situations where all my accessibility buddies and I were just like going to the bar drinking, sad about this. And most people were like, why are you so sad? And that's the problem. You see this graph. Um, the, the most common accessibility failures that they found were uh, low contrast, missing alt text, empty links, missing form labels, missing document language, and empty buttons. These are not convoluted things to fix, and many of them aren't even necessarily fixed in a super technical fashion. They're things that are being left out of CMSs or being neglected at the content creation phase. And um, sadly uh, for the number, because I think it's funny, most sites had at least 69 errors. The reason that we have this issue today is that we center the able-bodied and neurotypical experiences. So because most of us don't experience a lot of the issues and we don't use screen readers as our everyday thing, we are missing a lot of these errors. Uh, gender labels. I was, I'm trying to hack airlines this year, and so I've been signing up for a lot of different airline uh, rewards things. And I noticed something that I'd never noticed before, which is that all of these labels list male first, then female. And most of them only list male and female, sometimes the occasional other or does not disclose. Um, and I found myself, when this happened, I was like, oh my gosh, how have I never noticed this? And I found myself trying to justify it. Like, oh, well, maybe because there's fewer letters in male than female, and they're going in character count order. Or it's biblical. Um, Adam, uh, Adam was made first, and then Eve. So uh, it's just following biblical order. And I was like, no, that's not why. Um, we even look on our census. What is this person's sex? Mark one box, uh, male or female. And uh, this is a, uh, I was working on a, a contact or contact database and using Framer X, and one of the plugins is Tiny Faces. And uh, before you send hate uh, <laughs> towards the creator, it's since been resolved. But um, I, when I generated a, a whole sea of faces, I noticed that they were all uh, masculine or male presenting back to me. And I was like, that's weird. I mean, I know I work in tech, but like this is kind of ridiculous. And then I realized that there's a toggle that says gender, true, which is what gives you male, or false gives you female. And this is an issue for so many reasons. But it also contextualized to me, oh, that's why men on the internet are always telling me I'm wrong. <laughs> the reason for all of these issues is because we center the cis male experience. This is a soap dispenser, and um, person's dark skinned hand is not able to get the automated soap out of it. Um, and in the longer form of this GIF, uh, they take a, a paper towel, swipe it under, and it works. Also, self-driving cars are more likely to hit black pedestrians than white ones. Yikes. This is a uh, photo of a camera, and it's prompting, did someone blink? And she's not blinking. Uh, yeah, that one hits close home to me. The reason for all of this is because we center the white experience. This is a, uh, a, a device list from Dev tools. I won't say which one, uh, but uh, it's a problem in all of them. So if you're worried, it's an issue for everyone. <laughs> uh, all of these uh, phones that are listed are Galaxy, iPhone, you know, a couple random Lumias, of course, an OG Nokia hits. And then we have our tablets, iPads, Kindles, Nexus, and then agnostic laptops and agnostic televisions. That's fine and dandy, except that if we look at the world, the phones of the world, the, the brands that are represented are things like Huawei and Tecmo and all these phones that you've probably never even heard of, but they're lower, quote unquote, lower end devices that are usually sub $300 and uh, they 
aren't being centered in our testing. And that's because we center the American experience. And even outside of America, because of the power of Silicon Valley, I see these patterns happening all across the world, even in the countries where this has impacted the most. And the reason for this, and when I look back at this, I notice that we all cast a range, right? When we're doing our user testing, we set some sort of limits to things of skin tone, contrast, device prices. But what we didn't realize was that the range was broader than we were able to perceive. And that's because we always define a viewport. But our viewport, our worldview is very narrow. And we often like to deny this objectively. We love to say that like, no, we did really like robust user testing and it was very diverse and all this stuff. And we love to hide behind math. Uh, even you know, looking at the ways that we do this, we enter the binary in order to make ourselves feel better. You know, things are either usable or unusable or in the range of the doorway at my apartment building, maybe they defined a, a usable range of five feet to 511. Or when we're looking at internet speeds and, and time to interactive, 10 milliseconds to two seconds, Seconds, or when we're looking at distance, one mile to 10 miles. We've cast all of these ranges as acceptable ranges for use for our users. And sometimes we even like to abstract them. We like to say that uh, things are hard or easy, tall or short, fast or slow, far or near. But the problem with these definitions is they always enter the neurotypical, able-bodied, and wealthy experiences. Ryan Saavedra said this quote, um, socialist Republican Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez claims that algorithms which are driven by math are racist. And I think that when a lot of you hear that, you might not immediately see the issue with that. I think we think algorithms and development and the coding we do is very mathematical and very binary, but algorithms are made by people. And there are two books that I wish every developer, including that guy, um, would read, which are Algorithms of Oppression and Technically Wrong. It'll illuminate you to the ways in which algorithms are very, very laced in our perspectives as humans. We define the viewport. And in the viewport is this wall that I showed you. This is the viewport that we center. Even me as someone who doesn't fit squarely in that, I'm always really worried about everything fitting into that because that's what we define as the default setting. That's why male is first. When we look at this grid again, what we have to recognize is that our positions in life are, are absolute. But instead, we need to recognize that our positions are, in fact, relative, that everything we do needs to be contextualized in a relative terms. Like, what if design systems included the, the demographic makeups of the people on the team? And we just acknowledge the fact that we're all biased. It's OK. And so the next step in the install is to lessen our ignorance. We knocked down a few dependencies, I think. So when we look at this viewport, we recognize that we're centering it. What we have to do is the awareness that we're always focused on it. We're always focused above the fold. And if any of you have worked agency side and you've had a client that told you like, oh, can we get this above the fold? It's infuriating. But this is one instance where above the fold is right. So what we have to do is a curiosity for what lies beyond the fold. We need to scroll past our viewports. We need to consume media that doesn't center our own experiences. And a little anecdote, I don't know if those of you have seen this Pixar movie that came before Incredibles 2 called Bao. It's about a mother and son and their relationship with making dumplings. I won't ruin it for you, but when I first saw it in the theater, I was sobbing. It was the first time that I had seen myself and my own mom and our relationship depicted in such a poetic way in under 10 minutes. And I overheard people around me being like, that was so weird. What just happened? And they were laughing at it and mocking it. And they didn't understand it. And that's OK. But uh, it was really hard for me because literally, I think I was in my 30s when I saw this. Uh, it was the first time I had had my experience centered on the big screen in that way. And you just have to understand that when you watch something, that not everything is made for your understanding. I spent 30 some years with all white Disney princesses. So I think everyone can be cool with the fact that Ariel's black. Like you've had 30, over 30 years of that. You can, you can deal with it. Now here's what we call a hot take in this industry. I have a word about empathy. Empathy is a scam. 
And the reason for that is if we look back at the definition, empathy is the capacity to understand or to feel what another person is feeling or experiencing from within their frame of reference, i.e. viewport, and the capacity to place oneself in another's position. Yikes. Said another way, empathy seeks to validate someone else's experience by centering your own. And we do this every day in conversation. Pay attention when someone tells a story in a group. The first thing most of us do is we chime in with our own story that relates to it. And it's natural. It's our way of relating to the other person. But so often when we do that, particularly when we're talking to someone who's in a marginalized group, we are, we are erasing their experience and centering our centered experiences instead. So something I try to be mindful of when I'm um, having conversations. I'm not perfect at it, and I do it all the time. But it's something that I'm, I'm consciously trying to fix. The, the proclivity with empathy is to align the self to center. But I invite you, instead of trying to seek empathy, to instead replace empathy with trust. Why don't we trust our users' lived experiences over our own presumptions? We don't have to understand them for them to be relevant and insightful and helpful to our work and stop gaslighting lived experiences just because they aren't your own. So if someone tells you something that they experience and you don't understand it, don't tell them that it's wrong because that is their experience, it's real, and it, it makes sense for them based on the life that they've lived. And I love this quote from Angela Davis, which is a little morose, but she says, if they come for me in the morning, they will come for you in the night. And I say that because the most multiply marginalized people are screaming for help. I wrote an article for List Apart earlier this year called Cannery in a Coal Mine. And it was about how the most marginalized folks in tech are crying for all the things that are happening that are horrible, right? The ways in which tech is being used to abuse and to hurt people at scale. It's not common you hear at scale used like that, huh? But we're, we're the cannery, and many of you are the coal miners. And this quote is speaking to that because the cannery might die first but it's warning you of the toxicity levels. And if you don't listen, it will come for you too. So to fix this, I know that's a lot. There's a way that we can start to unpack this, which is to then share our power. There's a phrase that we use a lot in accessibility, which I've been since told is maybe a, a Polish phrase uh, or translation of a Polish phrase, but it's nothing about us without us. And what that means is that we shouldn't be creating things for people if we don't understand their lived experiences. They need to be part of the process. And not just part of the process as users who we test, they need to have meaningful positions of power. There's this great quote by Verna Myers where she says, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. It's lovely. But for me, justice is letting someone else throw the party. I don't know if you've ever been to a party thrown by a wealthy white guy, but they are not very fun. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm just asking for all of those of you who fit squarely into those boxes to retire from the stage, Rockstar. Stop speaking at all the speaking events. Stop writing every single tutorial. Stop accepting positions of, of power. Instead, become a roadie. Set the stage for somebody else. Use your privilege to get new voices on this stage. Hand over the keys to queer, disabled, trans, immigrant, Muslim, black, indigenous, women, and non-binary folks of color. But as we do this work and as people that, are, that tend to be on the fringes and marginalized get power, we also need to remember that scarcity is a capitalistic principle. So if we get on stage and we don't invite someone else on there, we're not really doing the work. And Angela Davis reminds us that we must learn to lift as we climb. So what if I took this grid and I replaced it with the opposite characteristics of the grid that we experience today? What if it were, poor, black, trans, Muslim, disabled, queer, non-American, neurodiverse um, folks instead. Well, I'll tell you for one, things would, would be a lot better. They wouldn't be perfect, but they would be a lot better. But that is not the point. The point isn't to take the tools of oppression and to put new people in power to use them. 
So I will ask today to tear down this wall, Chad. We need to dismantle this wall one by one. We don't want walls. So I ask of you today to do one thing before we hit commit on this install, which is to dedicate yourselves in every moment of every day. Resistance isn't just the simple acceptance of this plugin today and you go home and it's all fine. It is held within every single pull request that you do and every single design review and every single ableist or sexist or, or racist comment that your colleague or friend or family member makes. Resistance must be relentless. So I hope that you join me today in committing to that. Thank you very much.